Welcome to this week's online service from Beaconloft Baptist Church here in Gateshead. It's good to be back with you again and I hope you've had a good week. In a while, Pastor Bob will be sharing a message from his study. Also, we'll be hearing about the week of prayer for Christian unity and we'll have an update from the team at Open Doors. But first, I'd like to start our time of worship just with a moment of quiet. As part of the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity, Christians around the world are being encouraged to share together Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You've made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honour. You've made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet or flocks and herds, and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Faithful God, we come into your presence with thanksgiving, deeply grateful for the unfailing love and faithfulness you've shown towards us, your people. When we call out to you, you answer. When we are exhausted, you give us the strength to go on. When we find ourselves in trouble, you are there, standing beside us. And as we come before you this morning with gratitude and praise, offering you the worship of our hearts and lives, Open our eyes to see and know you are here among us. Open our ears to recognise your voice. And then, having spent time in your presence, send us out to live and work in the world as your faithful disciples. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. Amen.
God of hope, we come to you in the midst of a world in which we are wearied by uncertainty and restriction, frustrated by our inability to cope and overcome, concerned for loved ones and vulnerable strangers, bewildered and unclear about the road that lies ahead. And yet we come in hope, because in Jesus we see light that overcomes darkness, resurrection and life springing from brutality and execution, salvation born in the midst of human chaos, the broken and abandoned, healed and restored. We come in hope, because your words are the words of eternity, your promises stand unassailable and unchanging, and even in the midst of creation's deepest groans, we hear the song of eternity's dawn. We hear the song of hope. God of hope, though our hope may sometimes falter, hold us fast in your eternal love and inspire us again with the possibilities of your kingdom. Draw close to those whose hope is failing, strengthen those whose struggle is beyond what they can bear, comfort and restore those who feel broken by all we have endured. Grant what we need for this day's journey, the faith to believe that the demands of tomorrow will not be overwhelming, and the courage to continue in the face of all that present circumstances require of us. And help us to never forget that our hope is secure, for it remains founded on that which no earthly circumstance can ever overcome. Write that truth deep in our hearts, that we might speak its promise into the lives of all who walk this troubled road with us.
I'm here to tell you about the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity. This is a worldwide movement and each year a part of the world is invited to produce the materials and for this year the materials have been produced by churches in the Middle East. It's fitting, I think, that these churches, so often under huge pressure and persecution, should produce materials for the world when we're facing a global pandemic. The theme of their materials is, we saw his star in the East. The story of the Magi is one of how light has guided men to come and find the infant Christ. And of course, that theme of light in the darkness is so fitting for this year, a year when the pandemic has cast its shadow yet again across the world. And in this year of 2022, second year of a pandemic, how we need that good news that the light of Christ shines in the darkness. In this time of great challenge, we need one another in order to be most effective as the body of Christ, wherever we find ourselves. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we face the challenges and seize the opportunities of this coming week, fill us with your love and guide us by your spirit, that we may be lights wherever there is darkness and renew within us a passion for the unity of your church, that responding to the prayer of Jesus that we might be one as he and the Father are one, so the world might believe that you have sent Jesus to be the Saviour of the world. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us evermore. Amen. Christians live in fear, where churches are bombed and houses burned, where following Jesus means sacrificing jobs, security, family. There are countries where you must keep your faith secret or it might get you killed. These are the countries of the Open Doors World Watch List and here are the 10 countries where following Jesus costs the most. Number 10. 
India. Many extremists claim that to be Indian is to be Hindu. They want an India without religious minorities, and they are using violence to achieve it. Number 9. Iran Iranian Christians must meet secretly. Being discovered could mean long sentences in appalling prisons. Number 8. Pakistan Christians in Pakistan are considered second-class citizens. Innocent believers are falsely accused of blasphemy. Thousands of women are victims of kidnap and forced conversion. Number 7. Nigeria Nigeria is the country where Christians face the most outright violence. Many Christians have been killed or driven from their homes. Number 6. Eritrea More than 1,000 Christians are imprisoned for their faith in Eritrea. Some pastors have been locked up for over a decade without charge. Number 5. Yemen Yemeni culture is tribal. Those who leave the tribal faith could be banished or even killed. Number 4. Libya In this lawless land, Libyan Christians have to keep their faith secret or risk punishment, arrest or death. Number 3. Somalia Islamist extremists consider Somali Christians high-value targets. So the tiny population of only a few hundred secret believers keep out of sight. Number 2. North Korea There are around 400,000 Christians in North Korea. All of them must hide their faith. Discovery means exile, execution, or being worked to death in horrific labor camps. Number 1. Afghanistan the Taliban takeover means that Afghanistan is the new number one, the most dangerous place in the world to be a Christian. Many Christians have become refugees. Those who remain must keep their faith utterly secret. There are countries where Christians live in fear, but fear can lead to courage and courage leads to hope. At least 360 million Christians around the world experience high levels of persecution and discrimination. But they have not given up. And for over 65 years, Open Doors has stood with them. Where Christians are persecuted, our global underground networks supply smuggled Bibles and Christian books, spiritual care, emergency food and aid, training and legal advice. Where Christians are free, we work with local churches to raise our voices in prayer to speak truth to those in power, to strengthen our persecuted family around the world. Because there are countries where Christians have to stay silent, and there are countries where Christians can make a noise. But we are all connected. We are all family, and together we can help one another to follow Jesus, no matter the cost. Lord, we have heard of your fame. We stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. May your glory cover the heavens and your praise fill the earth. Come out to deliver your people, to save your anointed ones. Lord, we pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters that they will wait patiently for you to bring their persecutors to justice. And in the meantime, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, we pray that your whole church will yet be able to rejoice in you, Lord, that we will all be joyful in God our Saviour. You, Sovereign Lord, are our strength. Make our feet like the feet of a deer. Enable us to tread on the heights. In Jesus' name, Amen. Oh, 
Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. If you have a Bible with you, perhaps you'd turn with me to 1 John chapter 2, and we begin reading at verse 7. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I'm writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. 
They do not know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. Chapter 2 of 1 John demonstrates for us the practical goal towards which we should all be moving. And these next verses are really a commentary on the verses that we read last week. If you look way back at verse 5, But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. We can see from our reading that this working out of the Christian life should be the goal of the church, learning to love as God loves. And, the, and that really only works from within a true relationship with him. You know, the most desperate need of humanity is for love. And yet in our modern era, where technology is fast replacing community, where relationships, doctor's appointments and social care are decided online, it's hard to see where where developing any kind of relationship is possible. All this in an attempt at efficiency to meet the demands rather than the needs of the population. Many are becoming lonely and discouraged because there is no human contact. They feel that they don't matter, and that they're unloved and they're unwanted. The fact is, human beings need to have love. We crave love. But love is costly on all levels and it has to be real. Listen to this love letter. Dearest Jimmy, no words could ever express the great unhappiness I've felt since breaking our engagement. Please say you'll take me back. No one could ever take your place in my heart, so please forgive me. I love you. I love you. I love you. Yours forever, Marie. P.S. And by the way, congratulations on winning the lottery. Love has to be unconditional. C.S. Lewis said of love, To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable and irredeemable. The only place outside heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers of love is hell. In the past few weeks, we have seen that the need to experience the reality of Jesus in our life, to understand the reason why God became incarnate, and the fact that really he had no other option if he is truly to be a God of love. This love cost him dearly, but the cost was worthwhile. Such is the value that he places on you and me. The route to liberty as a believer, then, is to take on board and imbibe this truth that Jesus died to save sinners. The practical outworking of accepting the truth of God's love is of course seen in our personal devotional response as we recognise our sin and come in humble confession for forgiveness. And we touched on that briefly last week. But of course there's more to being a Christian than our private devotion. And even in our public worship we need to practice our first heading this week, walking in the light of love. Making decisions in the dark, you know, can lead to some real regrettable consequences. I read a rather amusing story of the days before electricity, and there was a tight-fisted old farmer who was complaining to his hired hand that he'd been using fuel for his lantern when he was going to see his girlfriend at night. And he said to him, well, listen, when I was courting, we never used one of those things. I always went in the dark. And the young man answered, well, yes, and look what you got. You know, it's a truth that some people change their ways when they see the light. Others only change when they feel the heat. Now, back in chapter one, John stresses the importance of walking in the light that Jesus provides. Walking in the light is essential to remaining in fellowship with him. And John understands what it is to be human. And he gets our inability to respond to the light as well as we would like to. 
And so he reminds us, look at chapter 1, verse 9, if we, forgive, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We can know that we know God and we are enabled by his spirit to walk in the light that he has provided. The fact that we often fail is neither here nor there. What is important is that we have a willing heart that is ready to be honest about our personal limits and to engage with reality, being willing to follow after the divine. Now, this doesn't mean that we blindly accept everything that we hear and so dwell on the extremes. What we have here is a real foundation for confidence. The fact that God's love reaches us no matter where we are physically or spiritually. And as we work out our faith, God perfects his love in us. Now, in chapter two, John has given us a reminder of the new command that Jesus gave way back in his gospel to enable us to walk in the light and to be people of light. Look at verse seven again. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard, yet I'm writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. These words seem a little bit strange. An old command, a new command. What does he mean? What is old and yet new? Now there's a clue in his words where he says, which you have had from the beginning. This means the beginning of your Christian life. Here is something that you learned when you first became a Christian. The new command is as old as time itself. We are to love God and love each other for Jesus' sake. Now back in John's Gospel, in chapter 13, Jesus said this, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Loving our Christian brothers and sisters is the evidence of our willingness and desire to keep God's commands. But it shows too that we have God as the authority of our being and that we acknowledge him as the only authority, as the one who has given us the example as to how we should live. So in extending God's love to others, we evidence our relationship with him. The new command to love in John 13 is an old command, but it could be considered new. In his sacrifice, Jesus displayed a kind of love never seen before, a love that you and I are to imitate. Now, if we were to use the cross as an illustration of this love, we can see that it's wide enough to include every person, long enough to last forever, deep enough to reach the worst sinner, and high enough to, take, to make heaven accessible to everyone. This is a new love. A love the world had never really seen until Jesus died on the cross for the sin of humanity. Walking in the light of love. Secondly, love the proof of new life. You know, our love for each other is a great proof of our new birth as children of God. But look at verse 9 again. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They don't know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. At this point, John is examining us according to our love for, for other Christians, which is really a measure of our relationship with and to God. Just as our rejection of sin and our obedience to God and his word is a measure of our fellowship with him, so also is our love for God's people. So says John, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. But conversely, anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. Now John is a pains to stress the importance of our love for each other, to the point where he uses the word hate. This is so opposite to love and light, and so naturally those in this state are blinded to anything that is good or true or noble or life-giving. Hate is a, a really strong word, 
but it's expressed not only in the obvious physical ways that give vent to aversion or intense dislike. It can be articulated in subtle ways as well. Hate can also be demonstrated passively. Exclusion, coldness, indifference and isolation, these are its most devastating weapons and these have no place in the kingdom of God. You know, it's been said many times that following Jesus would be easy if it weren't for all the Christians. Too many people have suffered the rejection or lack of affirmation in the church and often they've experienced real difficulty in trusting again and come to the opinion that really we shouldn't expect too much from other believers because, well, that's failed in the past. The fact is, says John, we can do something about it. If our church communities are not supportive and affirming places, then we have it in our power to correct the obvious mistakes. And really, that starts with us. And do note that this is not an option. The measure still stands. If we can't love each other, then we cannot claim a real love for God. The point is this. If we lose love, then we lose everything. There is nothing left. You can do all the right things, believe all the right truths and have the right image. But if you don't have love for your fellow believers, then everything is lost. This is powerful stuff because it has far reaching ramifications in the way that we think, in the way that we believe, in the way that we behave. And, you know, if we were just to take a moment to think back over this last week, for example, we soon come up short when we consider the judgments that we've made the opinions that we have voiced and the negative thoughts that have depressed us and other people. And all because there are times when we will not step out into the light. Love is costly. Let me read you this by Dick Hillis. She was lying on the ground. In her arms she held a tiny baby girl. As I put a cooked sweet potato into her outstretched hand, I wondered if she would live until the morning. Her strength was almost gone. But her tired eyes, they acknowledged my gift. The sweet potato could help so little, but it was all that I had. Taking a bite, she chewed it carefully. Then placing her mouth over the baby's mouth, she forced the soft, warm food into the tiny throat. Although the mother was starving, she used the entire potato to keep her baby alive. Exhausted from her effort, she dropped her head on the ground and closed her eyes. In a few moments the baby was asleep. I later learned that during the night the mother's heart stopped but her little girl lived. Love is a costly thing. God in his love for us and for a lost world spared not his own son to tell the world of his love. Love is costly but we must tell the world at any cost. If we were be a Christian today, to love, to live light in the light, it means everything. And it will cost you all that you have. Think about it. Every blessing. Thanks, Bob, for sharing with us this morning. If you'd like to speak with Bob, get in touch by the email address on the screen. Also, if you'd like to explore a little more about the Christian faith, we're planning to run a Christianity Explored course in the spring. If you think you might be interested again, just get in touch with Bob. Now here's Irene with our time of prayer for the fellowship. Let's join in prayer together. Romans 1 says this, God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night I bring you and your needs in prayer to him who I serve. And so with that in mind, loving God, we thank you for the privilege of prayer and for the way in which uh, it daily strengthens us. Thank you that we can approach you in the way that we do and that you care and you direct and you encourage and you enable us through this privilege. And so those in our fellowship just now, and there's a few who especially need your touch and we just want to pray for them now. We we thank you for both Andrea and Sadie Paterson's funeral. 
We thank you that they were blessings to those who attended. And we thank you for the witness of these two ladies who loved you, Lord. Be with their families as they grieve. We pray for Ben and Val. Ben's particularly not been too well this week and we just pray that he might be feeling better and especially well enough to enjoy his birthday yesterday. Bless both Ben and Val, Lord. We pray for Joe and Mary and they're struggling a bit with health issues and we just ask that you would strengthen Joe's mobility and uh, uh, and Mary too as they work together. Encourage them both. We pray for Joe Maines, who's uh, not been very well this week. We ask that you would draw close to him, make him feel better. And we pray for Jimmy Barris, Lord, that uh, he will get the uh, the right uh, kind and level of care to enhance his life, that uh, all these uh, plans will be put in place so that he can enjoy. Uh, we've seen Joan Farncombe this week, Lord, which was lovely, but we pray that you would continue to strengthen and bless her. And Sadie Lilly's still in hospital and after her hip operation, we pray that she might receive the appropriate assessment and the care that she needs. Bless her, Lord, and draw close to her. We remember all those in residential care and it's difficult at this time when visiting's uh, tricky because of uh, lockdowns and uh, we just ask that you would remind all our friends who are in residential care that, uh, th- that they're not forgotten about. We pray, Lord, for the girls and the leaders of the Girls' Brigade and we ask that uh, they might work together and more girls might come along to to learn about you and to have fun together. And so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your consistent and constant love and care that's so vital to all our uh, well-being. We thank you that you never leave us or forsake us and so we leave ourselves in your care And we just ask that you would bless each one of us, because we ask it in your name. Amen. Thanks, Irene. Also, thanks to Pastor Bob. Our final hymn was written by Charles Wesley in 1738, in response to his conversion to belief in Christ. In the third verse, we're reminded how God brings us to salvation in language that reminds us of Peter's experience in Acts 12, verses 6 to 11, where God sent an angel to open the prison doors and loose Peter's chains. The final verse is a jubilant celebration of our new state in Christ and the privilege of communion with God that we each enjoy. And can it be? And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died He for me who caused His pain for me who Him to death
that's bound in sin and nature's night. Thine I diffuse the quickening ray. I walk the dungeon flame with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. My chains fell. I'd like to close with a blessing taken from today's service to mark the week of prayer for Christian unity. Go now and live as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. Let us wake from sleep and Christ will shine upon us. Peace be to you and the whole community where you live. Share love with faith from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who have an undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for being with us this morning and I hope you'll join us again next week.
heart on history's page.